pictures reveal the arrogance with which the German warlords meet the charges of criminal injustice to civilized people. Prosecutor Robert Jackson of the United States opens the trial with a strong indictment of the defendant. I come to the discussion of terrorism and the preparation for the war. How a government treats its own inhabitants generally is thought to be no concern of other governments or of international society. Certainly few oppressions or cruelties would warrant the intervention of foreign powers. But the German mistreatment of Germans is now known to pass in magnitude and savagery any limits that is tolerable by modern civilization. Other nations, by silence, would take a consenting part in such crimes. These Nazi persecutions, however, take character as international crimes because of the purpose for which they were undertaken. The purpose, as we have seen, of getting rid of the influence of free labor, the churches, and the Jews, was to clear their obstruction to the participation, precipitation, of aggressive war. If aggressive warfare in violation of treaty obligation is a matter of international cognizance, the preparations for it must also be of concern to the international community. Terrorism was the chief instrument for securing the cohesion of the German people in war purposes. Moreover, these cruelties in Germany served as atrocity practice to discipline the membership of the criminal organizations to follow the pattern later in occupied countries. Through these police organizations and formations that are before you accused as criminal organizations, the Nazi party leaders, aided at some point in their basic and notorious purpose by each of the individual defendants, instituted a reign of terror. These espionage and police organizations were utilized to hunt down every form of opposition and to penalize every nonconformity. These organizations early founded and administered concentration camps. Buchenwald in 1933 and Dachau in 1934. And Dachau lies but a few miles from here and but a few hours drive. And we hope this tribunal will visit this place and see the magnitude of the layout which goes with a concentration camp and the implements of torture that remain. But these notorious names were not alone. Concentration camps came to dot the German map and to number scores. At first they met with resistance from some Germans. We have, captured a, we have a captured letter from Minister of Justice Gertner to Hitler, which is revealing of this. <clears throat> a Gestapo official had been persecuted, prosecuted, prosecuted for crimes committed in one of these camps, and the Nazi governor of Saxony had promptly asked that the proceedings be quashed. The Minister of Justice, greatly to his credit, in June of 1935, this was, protested. Because as he called to the attention of Hitler himself, and I now quote his, the statement of the Minister of Justice. In this camp, unusually grave mistreatments of prisoners has occurred at least since the summer of 1933. The prisoners not only were beaten with whips without cause, similarly as in concentration camp Bredo near Stettin, until they lost consciousness. But they were also tortured in other manners, that is, with the help of a dripping apparatus constructed exclusively for this purpose, under which prisoners had to stand until they were suffering from serious, purulent wounds of the scalp. I shall not take time to detail the ghastly proceedings in these concentration camps. Beatings, starvings, tortures, killings were routine. They were so routine that the tormentors became blasé and careless. We will show you a discovery that one night 
In one of these camps, 186 persons was executed when they only had orders to execute 180. And another report describes how they made a mistake and sent two urns to a family where there was only one victim. The inmates were compelled to execute each other. In 1942, they were paid five Reichsmarks per execution. But on June 27, 1942, SS General Glucks ordered commandants of all concentration camps to reduce this honorarium to three cigarettes. In 1943, the Reich's leader of the SS and chief of German police ordered the corporal punishment on Russian women to be applied by Polish women and vice versa. But the price was not frozen. He said, as a reward, a few cigarettes was authorized. Under the Nazis, human life had been progressively devalued until it finally became worth less than a handful of tobacco. Erzat's tobacco. There were, however, some traces of the milk of human kindness. On August the 11th, 1942, an order went from Himmler to the commanders of 14 concentration camps that, and I quote, only German prisoners are allowed to beat other German prisoners. It was due to policy. <clears throat> the chief of the SD reported that in accordance with orders from the Fuhrer, anxiety should be created in the minds of the family of the arrested person. <clears throat> Deportations and secret arrests were labeled with a Nazi wit that seems a little ghoulish, Nacht und Nebel, night and fog orders. On the 2nd of February, 1942, an order was issued for the chief of the Wehrmacht High Command, in which the uh, fields were advised that this decree carries a basic innovation. The Führer and Commander-in-Chief of the Armed Forces commands that crimes of the specified sort committed by civilians of the occupied territories are to be punished by the pertinent court-martials in the occupied territories only when a the sentence calls for the death penalty, and B, the sentence is pronounced within eight days after arrest. Only when both conditions are met does the Fuhrer and Commander-in-Chief of the Armed Forces hope for the desired deterrent effect from the conduct of punitive proceedings in the occupied territories. In other cases, in the future, the accused are to be secretly brought to Germany and the further conduct of the trial carried on here. I dislike to encumber your records with such morbid tales, but we are in the grim business of trying men as criminals. And these are the things that their agents say happened. We will show you these concentration camps in motion pictures, <coughs> just as the Allied armies found them when they arrived. But the proof here will be so overwhelming that I venture to predict that not one word of what I have now spoken will be denied. 
These defendants will only deny personal responsibility or knowledge. Under the clutch of the most intricate web of espionage and intrigue that any modern state has endured, and persecution and torture of a kind that has not been visited upon the world in many centuries, the elements of the German population, which were both decent and courageous, were annihilated. Those which were decent but weak were intimidated. Open resistance, which had never been more than feeble and irresolute, disappeared. But resistance, I am happy to say, always remained, although it was manifest in only such events as the abortive effort to assassinate Hitler on July 20th, 1944. With resistance driven underground, the Nazi had the German state in his own hands. But the Nazis not only silenced discordant voices, they created positive controls as effective as their negative ones. Propaganda organs on a scale never before known stimulated the party and party formations with a permanent enthusiasm and abandon such as we democratic peoples can work up only for a few days before a general election. They inculcated and practiced the Fuhrer principle, which centralized control of the party and the party-controlled state over the lives and thought of the German people who were accustomed to look upon the German state by whomever controlled with a mysticism that is incomprehensible to my people. All of these controls for their inception, from their inception, were exerted with unparalleled energy and single-mindedness to put Germany on a war footing. We will show from the Nazis' own documents their secret training of military personnel their secret creation of a military air force. Finally, a conscript army was brought into being. Financiers, economists, industrialists joined in the plan and promoted elaborate alterations in industry and finance to support an unprecedented concentration of resources and energies upon preparation for war. Germany's rearmament so outstripped the strength of her neighbors that in about a year she was able to crush the whole military force of continental Europe, exclusive of that of Soviet Russia, and then to push the Russian armies back to the Volga. These preparations were of a magnitude which surpassed all need of defense, and every defendant and every intelligent German well understood them to be for aggressive purposes. Before resorting to open aggressive warfare, the Nazis undertook some rather cautious experiments to test the spirit and resistance of those who lay across their path. They advanced, but only as others yielded, and kept in a position to draw back if they found a temper which made persistence dangerous. On March 7, 1936, the Nazis reoccupied the Rhineland and then proceeded to fortify it in violation of the Treaty of Versailles and the Pact of Locarno. They encountered no substantial resistance and were emboldened to take the next step, which was the acquisition of Austria despite repeated assurances that Germany had no designs on Austria, invasion was perfected. Threat of attack forced Schuschnigg to resign as Chancellor of Austria and put the defendant, Seisinkert, in his place. The latter immediately opened the frontier and invited Hitler to invade Austria to preserve order. On March 12th, the invasion began. The next day, Hitler proclaimed himself chief of the Austrian state, took command of its armed forces, and a law was enacted annexing Austria to Germany. Threats of aggression had succeeded without arousing resistance. Fears, nevertheless, had been stirred. 
They were lulled by an assurance to the Czechoslovak government that there would be no attack on that country. We will show that the Nazi government already had detailed plans for the attack. We will lay before you the documents in which these conspirators planned to create an incident to justify their attack. They even gave consideration, according to their own documents, to assassinating their own ambassador at Prague in order to create a sufficiently dramatic incident. They did precipitate a diplomatic crisis which endured throughout the summer. Hitler set September the 28th as the day when troops should be ready for action. Under the threat of immediate war, the United Kingdom and France concluded a pact with Germany and Italy at Munich on September the 29th, 1938, which required Czechoslovakia to acquiesce in the cession of the Sudetenland to Germany. It was consummated by German occupation on October the 1st, 1938. The Munich Pact pledged no further aggression against Czechoslovakia. But the Nazi pledge was lightly given and quickly broken. On the 15th of March, 1939, in defiance of the Treaty of Munich itself, the Nazis seized and occupied Bohemia and Moravia, which constituted the major part of Czechoslovakia not already ceded to Germany. Once again, the West stood aghast, but it dreaded war, and it saw no remedy except war, and it hoped against hope that the Nazi fever for expansion had run its course. But the Nazi world was intoxicated by these unresisted successes in open alliance with Mussolini and in covert alliance with Franco. Then having made a deceitful and delaying peace with Russia, the conspirators entered upon the final phase to renew world war. I am not going to prolong this address by detailing the steps leading to the war of aggression, which began with the invasion of Poland on September 1st, 1939. The further story will be unfolded to you by the British delegation from documents including those of the German high command itself. I speak only of the conspiracy aspects of the aggression. <coughs> the plans had been laid long in advance. As early as 1935, Hitler appointed the defendant Schacht to the position of general deputy for the war economy. We have the diary of General Jodl, the plan Otto, Hitler's own order for attack on Austria in case trickery failed. The Plan Green, which was the blueprint for attack on Czechoslovakia. The plan for the war in the West. Funk's letter to Hitler in August 25th, 1939, detailing the long course of economic preparation for war. We have the top secret mobilization order for 1939 or 40 prescribing the steps to be taken during a period of tension, as it was described, during which no state of war will be publicly declared, even if open war measures against the enemy will be taken. This latter order is in our possession, despite a secret order issued on March 16, 1945, when Allied troops were advancing into the heart of Russia to burn these plans. We have also Hitler's directive dated December 18, 1940 for the Barbarossa Contingency, which was a code name outlining the strategy of the attack on Russia. We have detailed, <coughs> and that plan in the original bears the initials of the defendants Keitel and of Yodel. They were planning the attack and planning it long in advance of the declaration of war. We have detailed information concerning the case White, which is the plan for the attack on Poland. That began the war. 
This was in June the 14th. The attack did not come until September. It's a top secret document. Only 20 copies were circulated. We have number eight. It starts. The commander in chief of the army has ordered the working out of a plan of deployment against Poland, which takes in account the demands of political leadership for the opening of the war by surprise and for quick successes. <coughs> it also provides that the, it declares that the, it is the duty of commanding generals divisional commanders and commandants to limit as much as possible the number of persons who will be informed and to limit the extent of the information so that no persons will get information of this plan. <coughs> we also have the order for the attack on England initialed again by Keitel and Yodel. It's interesting that it commences by saying that although the British military position is so helpless, hopeless, they show not the slightest sign of giving in. As early as November 5th, 1937, Hitler told the defendants Goering, Raider, and Neurath, among others, that German rearmament was practically accomplished and that he had decided to secure by force, starting with a lightning attack on Czechoslovakia and Austria, greater living space for Germans in Europe no later, than 1943 to 5, and perhaps as early as 1938. Not the least incriminating are the minutes of Hitler's own meetings with his high advisors, which we have. <coughs> These minutes were rather meticulously kept, as the Germans were apt to do and the Fuhrer advised his staff that it is a question of expanding living space in the east and of securing our food supplies. Over and above natural fertility, thoroughgoing German exploitation will enormously increase the surplus. And he said, there is therefore no question of sparing Poland, and we are left with the decision, their own underscoring, to attack Poland at the first suitable opportunity. He adds, we cannot expect a reposition, repetition of the Czech affair. There will be war. Conclusive evidence. When these men entered Poland, they knew they were precipitating war. On August 22, 1939, Hitler again addressed the members of the high command telling them when the start of military operations would be ordered. He disclosed that for propaganda purposes, he would provocate a good reason. But he added, it will make no difference whether this reason will sound convincing or not. After all, the victor will not be asked whether he talked the truth or not. We have to proceed brutally. The stronger is always right. It was at all times utterly hopeless for the Western powers to avoid war because Hitler was determined to make war. In his conference with all supreme commanders, Dated November 23, 1939, 
He said this. For the first time in history, we have to fight on only one front. The other front is at present free. But no one can know how long that will remain so. I have doubted for a long time whether I would strike in the east and then in the west. Basically, I did not organize the armed forces in order not to strike. The decision to strike was always in me. Earlier or, or later, I wanted to solve the problem. Under pressure, it was decided that the East was to be attacked first. We know the bloody sequel. Frontier incidents were staged. Demands were made for cession of territory. When Poland refused, the German forces invaded on September 1st, 1939. Warsaw was destroyed and Poland fell. The Nazis, in accordance with plan, which will be developed more fully by my colleagues, moved swiftly to extend their aggression throughout Europe and to gain the advantage of surprise over their unprepared neighbors. And I might say parenthetically that in this, uh, uh, these remarks of Hitler, he goes to some length pointing out that the powers of the West were unprepared and unexpectant of war. Despite repeated and solemn assurances of peaceful intentions, they invaded Denmark and Norway on the 9th of April, 1940. Belgium, the Netherlands, and Luxembourg on the 10th of May, 1940. Yugoslavia and Greece on the 6th of April, 1941. As part of the Nazi preparation for aggression against Poland and her allies, Germany on the 23rd of August, 1939, had entered into a non-aggression pact with Soviet Russia. It was only a delaying treaty intended as the documents will show, to be kept no longer than necessary to prepare for its violation. On June 22, 1941, pursuant to long-matured plans, the Nazis hurled troops into Soviet territory without any declaration of war. The entire European world was aflame. The extent to which Germany had incorporated territory and uh, the extent to which it had occupied and controlled territory. Now the Nazi plans did not stop at the point I have indicated. The Nazi plans involved a conspiracy with Japan. The Nazi plans of aggression called for the use of Asiatic allies, and they found among the Japanese men of kindred mind and purpose. They were brothers under the skin. Himmler records a conversation that he had on January the 31st, 1939, with General Oshima, Japanese ambassador at Berlin. <clears throat> We have Mr. Himmler's original memorandum signed with his signature. He wrote, among other things of his interview with Oshima, this. Furthermore, he, Oshima, had succeeded up to now to send 10 Russians with bombs across the Caucasian frontier. These Russians had the mission to kill Stalin. A number of additional Russians, whom he had also sent across, had been shot at the frontier. Exchanging secrets with the Japanese. On September the 27th, 1940, 
the Nazis concluded a German, Italian, Japanese, 10-year military and economic alliance by which those powers agreed to stand by and cooperate with one another in regard to their efforts in greater Asia and regions of Europe respectively wherein it is their prime purpose to establish and maintain a new order of things. On March 5th, 1941, a top secret directive was issued by the defendant Keitel. It stated this, quote, the Fuhrer has ordered instigation of Japan's active participation in the war. And it directed, quoting again, Japan's military power has to be strengthened by the disclosure of German war experiences and support of a military, economic, and technical nature has to be given. The aim was stated to be to crush England quickly and to keep the United States out of the war. <coughs> On March the 29th, 1941, the defendant Ribbentrop told Matsuoka, the Japanese foreign minister, that the German army was ready to strike against Russia. Matsuoka, in turn, reassured Ribbentrop about the Far East. Japan, he reported, was acting at the moment as though she had no interest whatever in Singapore, but, quoting, intends to strike when the right moment comes. On April 5th, Ribbentrop urged Matsuoka that entry of Japan into the war would, quoting, hasten the victory, end of the quote, and would be more in the interests of Japan than of Germany, since it would give Japan a unique chance to fulfill her national aims and to play a leading part in Eastern Asia. The proofs in this case will also show that the leaders of Germany were planning a war against the United States from its Atlantic, as well as instigating it from its Pacific approaches. A captured memorandum from the Fuhrer's headquarters, dated October the 29th, 1940, signed by General Falkenstein, asks certain information as to air bases <clears throat> and supply and reports here again we do not speculate we have the original document signed by the general and it says the dated October 29th 1940 the Fuhrer is at present occupied with the question of the occupation of the Atlantic Islands with a view to the prosecution of war against America at a later date. Deliberations on this subject are being embarked upon here. On December 7, 1941, a day which the late President Roosevelt declared will live in infamy, victory for German aggression seemed certain. The Wehrmacht was at the gates of Stalingrad. Taking advantage of that situation, and while her plenipotentiaries were creating a diplomatic diversion in Washington, Japan, without declaration of war, treacherously attacked the United States at Pearl Harbor and the Philippines. Attacks followed swiftly on the British Commonwealth, French Indochina, and the Netherlands in the Southwest Pacific. These aggressions were met in the only way that they could be met, with instant declarations of war and with armed resistance, which mounted slowly through many long months of reverse until finally the Axis was crushed to earth and deliverance for its victims was won. May it please your honors, I <clears throat> will now take up the subject of crimes in the conduct of the war. Even the most warlike of peoples have recognized in the name of humanity some limitations on the savagery of warfare. Rules to that end have been embodied in international conventions to which Germany became a party. This code had prescribed certain restraints as to the treatment of belligerents. The enemy was entitled to surrender 
to receive quarter and good treatment as a prisoner of war. We will show by German documents that these rights were denied, that prisoners of war were given brutal treatment and often murdered. This was particularly true in the case of captured airmen, often my countrymen. On June, 20, on June 1st, 1944, it was ordered that captured English and American airmen should no longer be granted the status of prisoners of war. They were to be treated as criminals, and the army was ordered to refrain from protecting them against lynching by the populace. This order uh, was sent out at the request of the Reichsfuhrer SS. I am sending you the enclosed order with the request that the chief of the regular police and of the security police be informed. They are to make this instruction known to their subordinates, subordinate offices, verbally. It is not the task of the police to interfere in clashes between Germans and English and American terror flyers who have bailed out. The Nazi government, through its propaganda agencies, took pains to incite the civilian population to attack and kill airmen who crash-landed. Similarly, we will show Hitler's top-secret order that commandos, regardless of condition, were to be killed to the last man. In that case, we have the uh, original documents with the Fuhrer's signature attached. We will show the circulation of secret orders to be passed orally to civilians that enemy parachutists were to be arrested or liquidated. By such means, murders were incited and directed. The Nazi campaign of ruthless treatment of enemy forces assumed its greatest proportions in the fight against Russia. Eventually, all prisoners of war were taken out of control of the army and put in the hands of Himmler and the SS. In the East, the German fury spent itself. Russian prisoners of war were ordered to be branded. They were starved. I shall quote passages from a letter written February 28, 1942, by the defendant Rosenberg to the defendant Keitel. And this is what he said. The fate of the Soviet prisoners of war in Germany is, on the contrary, a tragedy of the greatest extent. Of 3,600,000 prisoners of war, only several hundred thousand are still able to work fully. A large part of them has starved or died because of the hazards of the weather. Thousands also died from spotted fever. The camp commanders have forbidden the civilian population to put food at the disposal of the prisoners, and they have rather let them starve to death. In many cases, when prisoners of war could no longer keep up on the march because of hunger and exhaustion, they were shot before the eyes of the horrified civilian population and the corpses were left. In numerous camps, no shelter for the prisoners of war was provided at all. They lay under the open sky during rain or snow. Even tools were not made available to dig holes or caves. Finally, the shooting of prisoners of war must be mentioned. For instance, in various camps, all the Asiatics, and Asiatics is quoted, all of the Asiatics were shot. Civilized usage and conventions to which Germany was a party had prescribed certain immunities also for civilian populations that were unfortunate enough to dwell in lands overrun by hostile armies. The German occupation forces, controlled or commanded by men on trial before you, committed a long series of outrages 
against the inhabitants of occupied territory that would be incredible except for captured orders and captured reports which show the fidelity with which those orders were executed. We deal here with a phase of common criminality designed by the conspirators as part of a common plan. We can appreciate why these crimes against their European enemies were not of a casual character, but were planned and disciplined crimes only when we get at the reason for them. Hitler told his officers on August 22, 1939, that the main objective in Poland is the destruction of the enemy and not the reaching of a certain geographical line. Those words were quoted. The project of deporting promising youth from occupied territories was approved by Rosenberg on the theory that, quoting him, a desired weakening of the biological force of the conquered people is being achieved. To Germanize or to destroy was the program. Himmler announced, and I quote, either we win over any good blood that we can use for ourselves and give it a, pl a place in our people, or, gentlemen, you may call this cruel, but nature is cruel, we destroy this blood. That's the end of the quote. As to the racially good type types, Himmler further advised, and I quote again, therefore I think it is our duty to take their children with us, to remove them from their environment if necessary by robbing or stealing them. He urged deportation of Slavic children to deprive potential enemies of future soldiers. The purpose was to leave Germany's neighbors so weakened that even if she should eventually lose the war, she would still be the most powerful nation in Europe. Against this background, we must view this plan for ruthless warfare, which means a plan for the commission of war crimes and crimes against humanity. Hostages in large numbers were demanded and killed. Mass punishments were inflicted so savage that whole communities were extinguished. Rosenberg was advised of the annihilation of three unidentified villages in Slovakia. In May of 1943, another village of about 40 farms and 220 inhabitants was ordered wiped out. The entire population was ordered shot, the cattle and property impounded, and the order required that, quote, the village will be destroyed totally by fire. A secret report from Rosenberg's Reich Ministry of Eastern Territory where he was responsible, reveals this, and I quote it. Food rations allowed the Russian population are so low that they fail to secure their existence and provide only for minimum subsistence of limited duration. The population does not know if they will still live tomorrow. They are faced with death by starvation. The roads are clogged by hundreds of thousands of people, sometimes as many as one million, according to the estimate of experts who wander around in search of nourishment. Sokel's action has caused great unrest among civilians. Russian girls were deloused by men. Nude, nude photos in forced positions were taken. Women doctors were locked into freight cars for the pleasure, I, I think it's nurses, were locked into freight cars for the pleasure of the transport commanders. Women in nightshirts were fettered and forced through the Russian towns to the railroad station and so forth. All of this material has been sent to the OKH. Perhaps the deportation to slave labor was the most horrible and extensive slaving operation in history. On few other subjects is our evidence so abundant and so damaging. A speech of the defendant Frank, Governor General of Poland, made in January 25, 1944, boasts 
I have sent 1,300,000 Polish workers into the Reich. The defendant Sokel reported that, and I quote, out of the 5 million foreign workers who arrived in Germany, not even 200,000 came voluntarily. This fact was reported to the Führer and to the defendants Speer and Goering and Keitel. Children of 10 and 14 years were impressed into service. We have the, com the order in which command is, the command is, uh, is uh, further charged with transferring of worthwhile Russian youth between 10 and 14 years to the Reich. When enough slave labor was not forthcoming, prisoners of war were forced into war work in flagrant violation of international conventions. Slave labor came from France, Belgium, Holland, Italy, and the East. Methods of recruitment were violent. Treatment of these slave laborers was stated in general terms, not difficult to translate into concrete deprivations. In a letter to the defendant Rosenberg, from the defendant Sokel, <clears throat> it is stated, all the men, prisoners of war and foreign civilian workers must be fed, sheltered, and treated in such a way as to exploit them to the highest possible extent at the lowest conceivable degree of expenditure. It doesn't take uh, much imagination to translate that order into action. <clears throat> and prisoners of war, the same order, same captured order, provides all prisoners of war from territories of the West as well as of the East, actually in Germany, must be completely incorporated into the German armament and nutrition industries. A more flagrant violation of international law as to prisoners of war is inconceivable. But the order further provides the complete employment of all prisoners of war, as well as the use of a gigantic number of new foreign civilian workers, men and women, has become an indisputable necessity for the solution of the mobilization of labor program in this war. In pursuance of the Nazi plan, permanently to reduce the living standards of their neighbors and to weaken them physically and economically, a long series of crimes were committed. There was extensive destruction, serving no military purpose of the property of civilians. Dikes were thrown open in Holland almost at the close of the war, not to achieve military ends, but to destroy the resources and retired the economy of the thrifty Netherlanders. There was carefully planned economic siphoning off of the assets of occupied countries. An example of the planning is shown by a report on France dated December the 7th, 1942, made by the Economic Research Department of the Reichsbank. The question arose whether French occupation costs should be increased from 15 million Reichsmarks per day to 25 million Reichsmarks per day. The Reichsbank analyzed French economy to determine whether it could bear the burden. It pointed out that the armistice had burdened France to that date to the extent of 18 and a half billion Reichsmarks 
equaling 370 billion francs. It pointed out that the burden of these payments within two and a half years equaled the aggregate French national income in the year 1940, and that the amount of payments handed over to Germany in the first six months of 1942 corresponded to the estimate for the total French revenue for that year. The report concluded, and I quote, in any case, the conclusion is inescapable that relatively heavier tributes have been imposed on France since the armistice in June 1940 than upon Germany after the World War. In this connection, it must be noted, still quoting, that the economic powers of France never equaled those of the German Reich and that vanquished France could not draw on foreign economic and financial resources in the same degree as Germany after the last war. This is the end of the quote. The defendant Funk was the Reich's Minister of Economics and President of the Reich's Bank that made that report. The defendant Ribbentrop was Foreign Minister. The defendant Goering was plenipotentiary for the four-year plan. And all of them participated in this exchange of views of which this captured document is a part. Notwithstanding this analysis for the Reichsbank, they proceeded to increase the imposition on France from 10 million daily to 25 million Reichsmarks per day. It is small wonder that the bottom has been knocked out of French economy. The plan and purpose of the thing appears in a letter from General Stupnagel, head of the German Armistice Commission, to the defendant Jodl. As early as September 1940, when he wrote these words, the slogan, quote, systematic weakening of France, has already been surpassed by far in reality. Not only was there a purpose to debilitate and demoralize the economy of Germany's neighbors for the purpose of destroying their competitive position, but there was looting and pilfering on an unprecedented scale. We do not need to be hypocritical about this business of looting. I recognize that no army moves through occupied territory without some pilfering as it goes. Usually, the amount of pilfering increases as discipline wanes. Exactly the contrary with the German army. If the evidence in this case showed no looting, except from lack of discipline, I certainly would ask no conviction of these defendants for it. But we will show you that looting was not due to lack of discipline or to the ordinary weaknesses of human nature. The German organized plundering, planned it, disciplined it, and made it official, just as he organized everything else. And then he compiled the most meticulous records to show that he had done the best job of looting that was possible under the circumstances. And we have those records. The defendant Rosenberg was put in charge of a systematic plundering of the art objects of Europe by direct order of Hitler, dated September 17, 1940. On the 16th of April, 1943, Rosenberg reported that up to the 7th of April, 92 railway cars with 2,775 cases containing art objects had been sent to Germany, and that 53 pieces of art had been shipped to Hitler Direct and 594 to the defendant Gehring. <clears throat> the defendant apparently did 10 times as well in the collection of art objects as der Führer. The report also mentioned something like 20,000 pieces of seized art in the main locations where they were stored. Moreover, this looting was glorified by Rosenberg. Here we have 39 leather-bound volumes tabulated uh, the inventory, which in due time we'll offer in evidence. One cannot but admire the artistry of this Rosenberg report. 
39 volumes such as I hold in my hand. The Nazi taste was cosmopolitan. Of the 9,455 articles inventoried, there were included 5,255 paintings, 297 sculptures, 1,372 pieces of antique furniture, 307 textiles, 2,224 small objects of art. Rosenberg observed that there were approximately 10,000 more still to be inventoried. Rosenberg himself estimated that the values involved would come close to a billion dollars. The inventory is typically methodical, a list of the objects uh, dealt with in the particular volume and photographs of the great masterpieces of art looted from the cultural centers of Europe and shipped to Germany. 39 volumes. The one that I hold deals with paintings. Sculpture, likewise. Such was the looting that we're prepared to show in this case, not the looting of individual soldiers long away from home who help themselves to what comes to hand, but organized, systematic plans to loot Europe. I shall not go into further details of the war crimes and crimes against humanity committed by the Nazi gangster ring whose leaders are before you. It is not the purpose of my part of this case to deal with the individual crimes. I am dealing with the common plan or design for crime. I will not dwell on individual offenses. My task is to show the scale on which these crimes occur and to show that these are the men who in responsible positions conceived the plan, design, which renders them answerable regardless of the fact that the plan was executed by others. At length, this reckless and lawless course outraged the world. It recovered from the demoralization of surprise attack, assembled its forces and stopped these men in their tracks. Once success deserted their banners, one by one the Nazi satellites fell away. Sawdust Caesar collapsed. Resistance forces in every occupied country arose to harry the invader. Even at home, Germans saw that Germany was being led to ruin by these mad men. And the attempt on July 20th, 1944 to assassinate Hitler, an attempt fostered by men of the highest station, was a desperate effort by internal forces in Germany to stop short of ruin. Quarrels broke out among the failing conspirators, and the decline of Nazi power was even more swift than its ascendancy. German armed forces surrendered, its government disintegrated, its leaders committed suicide by the dozens, and by the fortunes of war, these men fell into our hands. Although they are not by any means all the guilty ones, they are the survivors among the most responsible. Their names appear over and over in the documents, and their faces grace the photographic evidence. We have here the surviving top politicians, militarists, financiers, diplomats, administrators, and propagandists of the Nazi movement. Who was responsible for these crimes if they were not? The end of the war and the capture of these prisoners presented the victorious allies with the question whether there is any legal responsibility on high-ranking men for acts which I have described. Must such wrongs either be ignored or redressed in hot blood? 
Is there no standard in the law for a deliberate and reasoned judgment on such conduct? The charter of this tribunal evidences a faith that the law is not only to govern the conduct of little men, but that even rulers are, as Lord Chief Justice Cook put it to King James, under God and the law. The United States believe that the law long has afforded standards by which a juridical hearing could be conducted to which we could make sure, so that we could make sure that we punish only the right men and for the right reasons. Following the instructions of the late President Roosevelt and the decision of the Alta Congress Conference, President Truman directed representatives of the United States to formulate a proposed international agreement which was submitted during the Far San Francisco Conference to foreign ministers of the United Kingdom, the Soviet Union, and the provisional government of France. With many modifications, that proposal has become the charter of this tribunal. But the agreement which sets up standards by which these prisoners are to be judged does not express the views of the signatory nations alone. Other nations, with diverse but highly respected systems of jurisprudence, have also signified adherence to it. These are Belgium, the Netherlands, Denmark, Norway, Czechoslovakia, Luxembourg, Poland, Greece, Yugoslavia, Ethiopia, Australia, Haiti, Honduras, Panama, and New Zealand. You judge, therefore, under an organic act which represents the wisdom, the sense of justice, and the will of 19 governments representing an overwhelming majority of all civilized people. The charter by which this tribunal has its being embodies certain legal concepts which are inseparable from its jurisdiction and which govern its decisions. These, as I have said, are also conditions attached to any grant of hearing to the defendants. The validity of the provisions of the Charter is conclusive upon us all, whether we have accepted the duty of judging or of prosecuting under it, as well as upon the defendants, who can point to no other law which gives them a right to be heard at all. My able and experienced colleagues believe, as do I, that it will contribute to the expedition and clarity of this trial if I briefly explain the application of the legal philosophy of the Charter to the facts which I have recited. While this declaration of the law by the Charter is final, it may be contended that the prisoners on trial are entitled to have it applied to their conduct only charitably, if at all. Of course, in codifying into a few paragraphs, many questions of application must be left unsolved. It may be said that this is new law, not authoritatively declared at the time they did the act that condemned, and that this declaration of law has taken them by surprise. I cannot, of course, deny that these men are surprised that this is the law. They really are surprised that there is any such thing as law. These defendants did not rely on any law at all. Their program ignored and defied all law. That this is so will appear from many acts and statements of which I cite but a few. I have already called your attention to the Fuhrer's remark before invading Poland that the victor is never asked whether he spoke the truth. In his speech to all military commanders, on November 23rd, he reminded them that at the moment Germany had a pact with Russia. But he declared, agreements are to be kept only as long as they serve a certain purpose. Later in the same speech, he announced, a violation of the neutrality of Holland and Belgium will be of no importance. A top secret document entitled Warfare is a Problem of Organization dispatched by the Chief of the High Command to all commanders on April 19, 1938, declared that, quoting, the normal rules of law toward neutrals must be considered to apply on the basis whether operation of rules 
will create greater advantages or disadvantages for the belligerents. And from the files of the German Navy staff, we have a memorandum on intensified naval warfare dated October 15, 1939, which begins by stating a desire to comply with international law. However, it continues, if decisive successes are expected from any measure considered as a war necessity, it must be carried through even though it is not in agreement with international law. International law, natural law, German law, any law at all, was to these men simply a propaganda device to be invoked when it helped and to be ignored when it would condemn what they wanted to do. That men may be protected in relying upon the law at the time they act is the reason that we find laws of retrospective operations sometimes unjust. But these men cannot bring themselves within the reason of the rule which in some systems of jurisprudence prohibits ex post facto laws. They cannot show that they ever relied upon international law in any state or paid it the slightest regard. The third count of the indictment is based on the definition of war crimes contained in the Charter. I have outlined to you the systematic course of conduct towards civilian populations and combat forces which violates international conventions to which Germany was a party. Of the criminal nature of these acts, at least the defendants had, as we shall show, the clearest knowledge. Accordingly, they took pains to conceal their violations. It will appear that the defendants, Keitel and Jodl, were informed by official legal advisors that the orders to brand Russian prisoners of war, to shackle British prisoners of war, and to execute commando prisoners were clear violations of international law. Nevertheless, these orders were put into effect. Same is true of orders issued for the assassination of General Giraud and General Vega, which failed to be executed only because of a ruse on the part of Admiral Canaris, who was himself later executed for his part in the plot to take Hitler's life on July 20th, 1944. The fourth count of the indictment is based on crimes against humanity. Chief among these are mass killings of countless human beings in cold blood. Does it take men by surprise that murder is treated as a crime? The first and second counts of the indictment add to these crimes the crime of plotting and waging wars of aggression and wars in violation of nine treaties to which Germany was a party. There was a time in fact, I think at the time of the First World War, when it could not have been said that war inciting or war making was a crime in law, however reprehensible in morals. Of course, it was under the law of all civilized people a crime for one man with his bare knuckles to assault another. How did it come that multiplying this crime by a million and adding firearms to bare knuckles made it a legally innocent act. The doctrine was that one could not be regarded as criminal for committing the usual violent acts in conduct of legitimate war. The age of imperialistic expansion during the 18th and 19th century added the foul doctrine, contrary to the teachings of early Christian and international law scholars such as Russia's, that all wars are to be regarded as legitimate wars. The sum of these two doctrines was for a time to give war making a complete immunity from accountability to law. This was intolerable for an age that called itself civilized. Plain people with their earthy common sense revolted at such fictions and legalisms, so contrary to ethical principles, and demanded checks on war immunities. Statesmen and international lawyers at first cautiously responded by adopting rules of warfare designed to make the conduct of war more civilized. The effort was to set legal limits to the violence that could be done to civilian populations and to combatants as well. The common sense of men after the First World War demanded, however, that the law's condemnation reach much deeper. 
and that the law condemn not merely uncivilized ways of waging war, but also the waging in any way of uncivilized wars, wars of aggression. The world's statesmen again went only as far as they were forced to go. Their efforts were timid and cautious, and often less explicit than we might have hoped. But the 1920s did outlaw aggressive war. The reestablishment of the principle that there are unjust wars and that unjust wars are illegal is traceable in many steps. One of the most significant is the Brian Kellogg Pact of 1928, by which Germany, Italy, and Japan, in common with practically all the nations of the world, renounced war as an instrument of national policy, found themselves to seek the settlement of disputes only by pacific means, and condemned recourse to war for the solution of international controversies. This pact altered the legal status of a war of aggression. As Mr. Stimson, the United States Secretary of State, put it in 1932, such a war of aggression is no longer to be the source and subject of rights. It is no longer to be the principle around which the duties, the conduct, and the rights of nations revolve. It is an illegal thing. By that very act, said Secretary Stimson, speaking on behalf of the United States, we have made obsolete many legal precedents and have given the legal profession the task of re-examining many of its codes and treaties. The Geneva Protocol of 1924 for the Pacific Settlement of International Disputes, signed by the representatives of 48 governments, declared that a war of aggression constitutes an international crime. The Eighth Assembly of the League of Nations in 1927, on unanimous resolution of the representatives of 48 member nations, including Germany, declared that a war of aggression constitutes an international crime. At the Sixth Pan-American Conference of 1928, the 21 American republics unanimously adopted a resolution stating that war of aggression constitutes an international crime against the human species. A failure of these Nazis to heed or to understand the force and meaning of this evolution in the legal thought of the world is not a defense or a mitigation. If anything, it aggravates their offense and makes it more mandatory that the law they have flouted be vindicated by judicial application to their lawless conduct. Indeed, by their own law, had they heeded any, these principles were binding on these defendants. Article 4 of the Weimar Constitution provided that the generally accepted rules of international law are to be considered as binding integral parts of the law of the German Reich. And there be any doubt that the offlawry of aggressive war was one of the generally accepted principles of international law in 1939? Any resort to war, any kind of war, is a resort to means that are inherently criminal as means. War inevitably is a course of killings, assaults, deprivations of liberty, and destruction of property. An honestly defensive war is of course legal and serves those, saves those lawfully conducting it from criminality. But inherently criminal acts cannot be defended by showing that those who committed them were engaged in a war which was itself illegal. The very minimum legal consequence of the treaties making aggressive wars illegal is to strip those who incite or wage them of every defense which the law ever gave and to leave war makers subject to judgment by the usually accepted principles of the law of crimes. But if it be thought that the Charter, whose declarations concededly bind us all, 
does contain new law, I still do not shrink from demanding its strict application by this tribunal. The rule of law in the world, flouted by lawlessness incited by these defendants, had to be restored at the cost to my country of over a million casualties, not to mention those of other nations. I cannot subscribe to the perverted reasoning that society may advance and strengthen the rule of law by the expenditure of morally innocent lives, but that progress in the law may never be made at the price of morally guilty lives. It is true, of course, that we have no judicial precedent for this charter. But international law is more than a scholarly collection of abstract and immutable principles. It is an outgrowth of treaties and agreements between nations and accepted customs. Yet every custom has its origin in some single act, and every agreement has to be initiated by the action of some state. Unless we are prepared to abandon every principle of growth in international law, we cannot deny that our own day has the right to institute customs and to conclude agreements that will themselves become sources of a newer and strengthened international law. International law is not capable of development by the normal processes of legislation, for there is no continuing international legislative authority. Innovations and revisions in international law are brought about by the actions of governments, such as those I have cited, designed to meet a change in circumstances. It grows, as did the common law, through decisions reached from time to time in adapting settled principles to new situations. The fact is that when the law evolves by the case method, as did the common law and the international law, must do if it is to advance at all, it does advance at the expense of those who wrongly guessed the law and learned too late their error. The law, so far as international law can be decreed, has been clearly announced when these acts took place. Hence, we are not disturbed by the lack of a judicial precedent for the inquiry which it is proposed to conduct. The events I have earlier recited clearly fall within the standards of crime set out in the Charter, whose perpetrators this tribunal is convened to judge and if guilty to punish fittingly. The standards for war crimes and crimes against humanity are too familiar to need comment. There are, however, certain novel problems in applying other precepts of the Charter which I should call to your attention. A basic provision of the Charter is that to plan, prepare, initiate, or wage a war of aggression or a war in violation of international treaties, agreements, or assurances, or to conspire or participate in a common plan to do so is a crime. It is perhaps a weakness in this charter that it fails to define a war of aggression. Abstractly, the subject is full of difficulty and all kinds of troublesome hypothetical cases can be conjured up. It is a subject which, if the defense should be permitted to go afield beyond the very narrow charge in the indictment, would prolong the trial and involve us in insoluble political issues. But so far as the question can properly be involved in this case, the issue is one of no novelty and is one on which legal opinion has well crystallized. One of the most authoritative sources of international law on this subject is the Convention for the Definition of Aggression, signed at London on July 3, 1933, by Romania, Estonia, Latvia, Poland, Turkey, the Soviet Union, Persia, and Afghanistan. The subject has also been considered by international committees and by commentators whose views are entitled to the greatest respect. It had been little discussed prior to the First World War, but has received much attention as international law has evolved its outlawry of aggressive war. In the light of these materials of international law, and so far as it is relevant to this case, I suggest that an aggressor 
is generally held to be that state which is the first to commit any of the following actions. One, a declaration of war upon another state. Two, invasion by its armed forces with or without a declaration of war of the territory of another state. Three, attack by land, naval or air forces with or without a declaration of war on the territory, vessels or aircraft of another state. And fourth, provision of support to armed bands formed in the territory of another state or refusal notwithstanding the request of the invaded state to take in its own territory all measures in its power to deprive those bands of assistance and protection. And I further suggest that it is the general view that no political, military, economic, or other considerations shall serve as an excuse or justification for such aggressive actions. But of course, the exercise of the right of legitimate self-defense, that is to say, resistance to an act of aggression, or action to assist a state which has been subjected to aggression, shall not, of course, constitute a war of aggression. It is upon such an understanding of the law that our evidence of conspiracy to provoke and wage an aggressive war is prepared and presented. By this test, each of the series of wars begun by these Nazi leaders was unambiguously aggressive. It is important to the duration and scope of this trial that we bear in mind the difference between our charge that this war was one of aggression and a position that Germany had no grievances. We are not inquiring into the conditions which contributed to causing the war. They are for history to unravel. It is no part of our task to vindicate the European status quo of 1933 or as of any other date. The United States does not desire to enter into discussion of the complicated pre-war currents of European politics, and it hopes that this trial will not be protracted by their consideration. The remote causations of Vaud are too insincere and inconsistent, too complicated and doctrinaire to be the subject of profitable inquiry in this trial. A familiar example is to be found in the Lebensraum slogan, which summarized the contention that Germany needed more living space as a justification for expansion. At the same time that the Nazis were demanding more space for the German people, they were demanding more German people to occupy space. Every known means to increase the birth rate, legitimate and illegitimate, were utilized. Lebensraum represented a vicious circle of demand from neighbors, more space, and from Germany, more progeny. We need not investigate the verity of such doctrines which lead to constantly expanding circles of aggression. It is the plot and the act of aggression which we charge to be crimes. Our position is that whatever grievances a nation may have, however objectionable it finds the status quo. Aggressive warfare is not a legal means for settling those grievances or for altering those conditions. It may be that the Germany of the 1920s and 30s faced desperate problems, problems that would have warranted the boldest measures short of war. All other methods, persuasion, propaganda, economic competition, diplomacy, were open to an aggrieved country, but aggressive warfare was outlawed. These defendants did make aggressive war, a war in violation of treaties. They did attack and invade their neighbors in order to effectuate a foreign policy which they knew could not be accomplished by measures short of war. And that is as far as we propose or need to inquire, because that is as far as we accuse. 
The Charter also recognizes individual responsibility on the part of those who commit acts defined as crimes or who incite others to do so, or who jo join a common plan with other persons, groups, or organizations to bring about their commission. The principle of individual responsibility for piracy and brigandage, which have long been recognized as crimes punishable under international law, is old and well established. That is what illegal warfare is. This principle of personal liability is a necessary, as well as a logical one, if international law is to render real help to the maintenance of peace. An international law which operates only on states can be enforced only by war, because the most practicable method of coercing a state is warfare. Those familiar with American history know that one of the compelling reasons for adoption of our Constitution was that the laws of the Confederation, which operated on constituent states, were found ineffective to maintain order among them. The only answer to recalcitrance was omnipotence, impotence, or war. Only sanctions which reach individuals can peacefully and effectively be enforced. Hence the principle of the criminality of aggressive war is implemented by the Charter with the principle of personal responsibility. Of course, the idea that a state any more than a corporation commits a crime is a fiction. Crimes always are committed only by persons. While it is quite proper to employ the fiction of responsibility of a state or corporation for the purpose of imposing a collective liability, it is quite intolerable to let such a legalism become the basis of a personal immunity. The Charter recognizes that one who has committed criminal acts may not take refuge in superior orders nor in the doctrine that his crimes were acts of state. These twin principles working together have heretofore resulted in immunity for practically everyone concerned in the really great crimes against peace and mankind. Those in lower ranks were protected against liability by orders of their superiors. The superiors were protected because their orders were called acts of state. Under the Charter, no defense based on either of these doctrines can be entertained. Modern civilization puts unlimited weapons of destruction in the hands of its statesmen. It cannot tolerate so vast an area of legal irresponsibility. Even the German military code provides, and I quote, if the execution of a military order in the course of duty violates the criminal law, then the superior officer giving the order will bear the sole responsibility therefore. However, the obeying subordinate will share the punishment of the participant, one, if he has exceeded the order given to him, or two, if it was within his knowledge that the order of his superior officer concerned an act by which it was intended to commit a civil or military crime or transgression. Of course, we do not argue that the circumstances under which one commits an act should be disregarded in judging its legal effect. A conscripted private on a firing squad cannot be expected to hold an inquest on the validity of the execution. The Charter implies common sense limits to liability, just as it places common sense limits on immunity. But none of these men before you acted in minor parts. Each of them was entrusted with broad discretion and exercised great power and knew the purpose of the acts they were committing. Their responsibility is correspondingly great and may not be shifted to that fictional being, the state, which cannot be produced for trial, cannot testify, and cannot be sentenced. Charter also recognizes a vicarious liability which 
Responsibility is recognized by most modern systems of law for acts committed by others in carrying out a common plan or conspiracy to which the defendants have become a party. I need not discuss the familiar principles of such liability. Every day in the courts of countries associated in this prosecution, men are convicted for acts that they did not personally commit, but for which they were held responsible because of memberships in illegal combinations or plans or conspiracies. Accused before this tribunal as criminal organizations, are certain political and police organizations which the evidence will show to have been instruments of cohesion in planning and executing the crimes I have detailed. Perhaps the worst of the movement with the leadership core of the Nazi party, the SS, the SA, and the subsidiary formations which these include. They were the Nazi party leadership, espionage, and policing groups. They were the real government above and outside of the law. Also accused as organizations of the Reich Cabinet and the secret police or Gestapo, which were fixtures of the government, but were animated solely by the party. Except for a late period, when some compulsory recruiting was done in the SS, membership in all of these militarized organizations was voluntary. The police organizations were recruited from ardent partisans who enlisted blindly to do the work the leaders planned. The Reich cabinet was the governmental facade for Nazi party government, and in its members, legal as well as actual responsibility was vested for the program. Collectively, they were responsible for the program in general. Individually, they were responsible for particular segments of it. The finding which we ask you to make that these are criminal organizations will subject members to punishment to be hereafter determined by appropriate tribunals unless some personal defense, such as becoming a member under duress, under threat to the person or to family or inducement by false representation or the like can be established. Every member will have a chance to be heard in the subsequent forum on his personal relation to the organization. But your finding in this trial would conclusively establish the criminal character of the organization as a whole. We have also accused as criminal organizations the high command and the general staff of the German armed forces. We recognize that to plan warfare is the business of professional soldiers in all countries. But it is one thing to plan strategic moves in event war comes, and it is another thing to plot and intrigue to bring on that war. We will prove that the leaders of the German general staff and the high command have been guilty of just that. Military men are not before you because they have served their country. They are here because they mastered it and along with others drove it to war. They are not here because they lost a war, but because they started one. Politicians may have thought of them as soldiers, but soldiers knew they were politicians. We ask that the general staff and the high command, as defined in this indictment, be condemned as a criminal group whose existence and tradition constitute a standing menace to the peace of the world. These individual defendants did not stand alone in crime and will not stand alone in punishment. Your verdict of guilty against these organizations will render prima facie guilty as nearly as we can learn many thousands of members now in the custody of the United States forces and of other armies. To apply the sanctions of the law to those whose conduct is found criminal by the standards I have outlined is the responsibility committed by the Charter to this tribunal. It is the force first court ever to undertake the difficult task of overcoming the confusion of many tongues and the conflicting concepts of just procedure among diverse systems of law so as to reach a common judgment. 
The tasks of all of us are such as to make heavy demands on patience and goodwill. Although the need for prompt action has admittedly resulted in imperfect work on the part of the prosecution, our great nations bring you their hurriedly assembled contributions of evidence. What remains undiscovered, we can only guess. We could, with witnesses' testimony, prolong the recital of crime for years. But to what avail? We shall rest the case when we have offered what seems convincing and adequate proof of the crimes charged without unnecessary accumulation of evidence. We doubt very much whether it will be seriously denied that the crimes I have outlined took place. The effort will undoubtedly be to mitigate or escape personal responsibility. Among the nations which unite in accusing these defendants, the United States perhaps is perhaps in a position to be the most dispassionate for having sustained the least injury it is perhaps the least animated by vengeance. Our American cities have not been bombed by day and by night, by humans and by robots. It is not our temples that have been laid in ruins. Our countrymen have not had their homes destroyed over their heads. The menace of Nazi aggression, except to those in actual service, has seemed less personal and immediate to us than to European people. But while the United States would not be first in rancor, it is not second in determination that the forces of law and order be made equal to the task of dealing with such international lawlessness as I have recited here. Twice in my lifetime, the United States has sent its young manhood across the Atlantic, drained its resources, and burdened itself with debt to help defeat Germany. But the real hope and faith that has sustained the American people in these great efforts was that victory for ourself and our allies would lay the basis for an ordered international relationship in Europe and would end the centuries of strife on this embattled continent. Twice we have held back in the early stages of European conflict in the belief that it might be confined to a purely European affair. In the United States, we have tried to build an economy without armament, a system of government without militarism, and a society where men are not regimented for war. This purpose, we know, can never be realized if the world periodically is to be embroiled in war. The United States cannot, generation after generation, throw its youth or its resources onto the battlefields of Europe to redress the lack of balance between Germany's strength and that of her enemies, and to keep the battles from our shores. The American dream of a peace and plenty economy, as well as the hopes of other nations, can never be fulfilled if these nations are involved in a war every generation so vast and devastating as to crush the generation that fights and to burden the generations that follow. Experience has shown that wars are no longer local. All modern wars become world wars eventually, and none of the big nations at least can stay out. If we cannot stay out of wars, our only hope is to prevent wars. I am too well aware of the weakness of juridical action alone to contend that in itself your decision under this charter can prevent future wars. Judicial action always comes after the event. Wars are started only on the theory and in the confidence that they can be won personal punishment to be suffered only in event 
the war is lost will probably not be a sufficient deterrent to prevent a war where the war makers feel the chances of defeat to be negligible. But the ultimate step in avoiding periodic wars, which are inevitable in a system of international lawlessness, is to make statesmen responsible to law. And let me make clear that while this law is first applied against German aggressors, the law includes, and if it is to serve a useful purpose, it must condemn aggression by any other nations, including those which sit here now in judgment. <coughs> we are able to do away with domestic tyranny and violence and aggression by those in power against the rights of their own people only when we make all men answerable to law. This trial represents mankind's desperate effort to apply the discipline of the law to statesmen who have used their powers of state to attack the foundations of the world's peace and to commit aggressions against the rights of their neighbors. The usefulness of this effort to do justice is not to be measured by considering the law or your judgment in isolation. This trial is part of the great effort to make the peace more secure. One step in this direction is the United Nations Organization, which may take joint political action to prevent war if possible, and joint military action to ensure that any nation which starts a war will lose it. This charter and this trial, implementing the Kellogg-Briand Pact, constitute another step in the same direction juridical action of a kind to ensure that those who start a war will pay for it personally. While the defendants and the prosecutors stand before you as individuals, it is not the triumph of either group alone that is committed to your judgment. Above all personalities, there are anonymous and impersonal forces whose conflict makes up much of human history. It is yours to throw the strength of the law back of either the one or the other of these forces for at least another generation. What are the forces that are contending before you? No charity can disguise the fact that the forces which these defendants represent, the forces that would advantage and delight in their acquittal, the forces with which they have identified themselves and whose crimes they have committed, are the darkest and most sinister forces in society. Dictatorship and oppression, malevolence and passion, militarism and lawlessness. By their fruits we best know them. Their acts as we shall recount them before you have bathed the world in blood and set civilization back a century. They have subjected their European neighbors to every outrage and torture, every spoliation and deprivation that insolence and cruelty and greed could inflict. They have brought the German people to the lowest pitch of wretchedness from which they can entertain no hope of early deliverance. They have stirred hatred and incited domestic violence on every continent. These are the things that stand in the dock shoulder to shoulder with these prisoners. The real complaining party at your bar is civilization. In all our countries, it is still a struggling and imperfect thing. It does not plead that the United States or any other country has been blameless of the conditions which made the German people easy victims to the blandishments and intimidations of the Nazi conspirators. But it points to the dreadful sequence of aggressions and crimes I have recited. It points to the weariness of flesh the exhaustion of resources, and the destruction of all that was beautiful or useful in so much of the world, and to greater potentialities for destruction in the days to come. It is not necessary among the ruins of this ancient and beautiful city, with all untold numbers of its civilian inhabitants still buried in its rubble, to argue the proposition that to start or wage an aggressive war has the moral qualities of the worst of crimes. The refuge of the defendants 
can be only their hope that international law will lag so far behind the moral sense of mankind that conduct which is crime in moral sense must be regarded as innocence in law. We challenge that proposition. Civilization asks whether law is so laggard as to be utterly helpless to deal with crimes of this magnitude by criminals of this order of importance. It does not expect that you can make war impossible. It does expect that your juridical action will put the forces of international law, its precepts, its prohibitions, and most of all, its sanctions on the side of peace so that men and women of goodwill in all countries may have leave to live by no man's leave underneath the law. <laughs>